We have someone from Italy today. That's fabulous. Hello, Colorado friends. Hello from Kentucky. And I actually have the sound turned off on my computer. So if your microphone icon doesn't have a red line through it, we might be able to hear you. So just make sure that's muted. Hello from Wyoming, awesome. So we'll learn about most of these birds pictured here today, although not all of them pictured are necessarily waterfowl. Most people include ducks, geese, swans, cranes, and grebes as part of the waterfowl group, but we'll get into taxonomic differences in a little bit. So today we are going to explore all about waterfowl, their adaptations and their habitat and what makes them unique. We'll talk about how to identify common waterfowl, and we'll focus on some that are pretty common and can be seen almost anywhere in North America, depending on what time of year you're going out and visiting them. And also some tips and tricks on how to successfully and safely view waterfowl. So what makes waterfowl unique? So again, I'm gonna ask you to type into the chat window any adaptations or qualities that waterfowl have that make them different from other birds. So here's a picture of our most common North American duck, a female mallard, to maybe help jog your memory. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to type in your thoughts. Webbed feet, yep. Waterproof feathers down. Ooh, this bird is a dabbler, not a diver. We'll get into those differences in a second too. Dense bones, no oil to aid in diving. Good point. So I'm gonna run through these. We've got some strong swimmers. Our, most of our waterfowl are called that because they live on or near the water most of their lives. So being a strong, able swimmer is really important. And they're adapted to their aquatic lifestyle. Some of those adaptations include those webbed feet and our grebes have a special, specially adapted lobed feet that assist in their lifestyle. So those webbed feet are kind of acting like a paddle or an oar, and they definitely help for their swimming or scratching on the surface of shallow waters, um, scratching on the ground to pick up insects, things like that. They've got broad, flat, and rounded tip bills. So we'll look closer at a, at a duck's bill in a second and see kind of the, some of those special adaptations they have in their mouths. Most species are migratory. So this is a good, time to, a, a good time of year to be viewing waterfowl. And you might see them in huge groups. Sometimes you can get groups of hundreds of thousands of birds in one area in one migratory season. They also have a preening gland. So this is, this is also called the uropygial gland. And this helps keep those feathers waterproof or mostly waterproof to keep them warm in those cold winter months. So a lot of these birds frequent really, really cold habitats and really warm habitats throughout their lifetime. 
Many are also dimorphic. So this is another term that means one group of the species showing bolder colors or markings than, the, than another group in their species. So typically the males are gonna be really brightly colored and the females are gonna look more like this mallard here who she will be protecting her eggs and trying to remain hidden a lot of her life, which is why she has that coloring. Fabulous. Well, I'll touch on our habitat as well. So these are waterfowl. They are adapted to an aquatic life. So when comparing them side by side with other birds like our passerines and our songbirds or our raptors, which we'll be covering next week, waterfowl, they just belong on the water. They have these oval shaped bodies that work just like a buoy and these webbed or lobed feet that help them swim and dive through the water. Their bills are going to differ in size, shape and color but they all are specially adapted with these serrations that look a little bit like teeth, helping them strain their food out of the water. So in that upper left picture, you can see a duck with those serrations kind of sticking out. A lot of times when I'm working with kiddos, they, they say, hey, that duck has teeth. And I point out, well, birds don't have teeth, but ducks are specially adapted to strain their food out of the water, giving them the, the image that they, that they have teeth. <laughs> All right, so what do ducks eat? Now that we're talking about ducks in their mouths, what do they eat? So type into the chat window what you think. Not every waterfowl species eats the same food. So let's brainstorm what kind of things they'd be finding in and around the water. Fish, bugs, weeds, greens, totally. Yep, so it depends on the species. A lot of a lot of our waterfowl are going to eat whatever they can they can catch. So a lot of a lot of animals are this way. They they might have one favorite thing, a lot of ducks like insects, little bugs, and macroinvertebrates they'll find in the water, but also leafy vegetation and things they'll find in the water as well. We'll touch on a couple of birds that are actually predators in a little bit. Worms, definitely. So our waterfowl often find shelter among tall grasses and trees or shallow waters. Um, depending on the species, they're gonna prefer a, a unique nest location. So our, like I said before, our females usually have that drab coloration that helps them blend in with their surroundings and protect their eggs or hatchlings. They often migrate in huge groups. And perhaps maybe you've witnessed one of these big migrations. For me in Nebraska, it's definitely the sandhill cranes. While I don't live quite east enough to witness the, the huge, huge flocks, a couple days ago I was able to go out and walk around some cornfields and get some good pictures of sandhill cranes. So now I'll break it down into a couple of different groups of ducks. So uh, groups of waterfowl, pardon me. So while waterfowl isn't a scientific um, classification, it's often a term used by hunters and conservationists to separate these birds into groups that might be more designated for hunting. So I won't go through each of these species, but I will talk a little bit about why they've been separated into these groups. So first off, we've got our dabbling, whistling, and perching ducks. So dabbling ducks typically live in fresh water. They're going to feed in shallow water by dabbling or upending themselves. So in that bottom photo, that's two mallards with their butts out in the air and they are sticking their neck down in the water, chewing or nibbling with little bites to, to pick up any stuff in the water that they might wanna eat. So if you're a true dabbler, you're gonna you're gonna eat like that. And if you're viewing a lot of waterfowl at once and you see some birds behaving this way, it will definitely help you narrow down what bird that could be when it comes to identifying them. So our dabblers are also often very vocal. The females will give more hoarse quacking calls and males calls can include whistles, squeaks, and honks. 
So we've got a couple of our whistling ducks in here as well. They make some crazy sounds. And then our perching ducks also belong in this group. And that includes the wood duck, which is pictured above. And they nest in trees. So they don't all nest in shallow waters or in, in tall vegetation near the water. Sometimes you might find ducks even in trees. We've got our diving ducks and mergansers. So our diving ducks are really agile swimmers and they're going to dive far beneath the surface of the water and search for food. So while our dabblers might not be able to dive very far underneath the water, these guys are pros at going down and kind of swimming around looking for food. So they prefer to stay in the water. They can be pretty ungainly and awkward on land and they'll completely submerge themselves, sometimes being underwater for up to a minute. So we've got our mergansers in this group, and they are one of the only types of ducks that eat a large amount of fish and similar prey, and their bills are specialized to make them keen hunters. So they've got kind of more of a narrow bill, narrow and skinny, and it's great for even piercing their prey while they're hunting. We've also got sea ducks. So these are the ones that you won't be seeing in Nebraska or Colorado very frequently because they're typically found in northern Arctic habitats and around the coasts. So eiders in particular, this picture here is a king eider. They're known for their lush down feathers and they have spectacular insulating properties that protect them from the harsh cold. However, because of this, they have been hunted extensively for their feathers, but now they are strongly protected by conservation laws. So our surf scoter, Tyler's favorites in this group, our harlequin duck, really beautiful, and our eiders. This is our largest group of birds in the waterfowl group, our largest birds. So this includes geese, swans, and cranes. Pictured here are two whooping cranes. And this includes also our geese, you know, the Canada goose, everybody's favorite. The tundra swan, the trumpeter swan are our two native swans to North America. And lastly, we've got our grebes. So these are the smallest birds in the waterfowl group. And sometimes they get left out, but they're just so cute, I had to include them. So pictured here is Clark's grebe looks really similar to our western grebe. We've got a couple more in North America as well. Fabulous. So we'll talk about a couple steps to identifying these birds and because they do form large groups and they might be looking for a habitat that is a large lake, you might see a lot of species on the water at a time and identifying them can be pretty tricky. So it's good to start with one species really and kind of master that one before moving on to the next one. You might see a lot of different species in one large group. So just focusing on one at a time is kind of the best way I have found for identifying them. So on the top, we've got our two mallard drakes flying. And when we're Trying to identify waterfowl, we want to look for their behavior. So how are they acting? Are they diving underneath the water and are they submerged for almost a minute? Because that might be a diving duck. You know, are they sticking their butt in the air? Because that might be a dabbling duck. And how are they flying? So pictured here, we've got three different groups of waterfowl and their unique flight habits. So on the top, those ducks, they're going to fly in kind of small groups and when they fly, they have short wings compared to the size of their body and they need to flap constantly in order to stay aloft. So if you see some small-ish birds flapping very fast, those might be ducks. Whereas in the middle picture, that's a bunch of Canada geese flying and they typically do their V formation while they fly. Those are usually easy to spot from far away. If you're used to looking at Canada geese, you might recognize that white crescent shape on the side of their face and longer wings compared to the ducks and slower flight movements compared to ducks as well. So they will fly flap constantly, but it'll be more of a slow controlled movement 
rather than that rapid flight of, of the ducks. And then on the bottom, we've got some cranes. And you can see that their wings are a lot longer compared to the size of the geese or the ducks. And also they stick their legs out in the back when they're flying. So they're gonna look like a really long body with huge wings that flap pretty slow and controlled as well. So noticing them in flight may be difficult to identify them from that point, but narrowing it down to a group can certainly help. And size is going to differ as well. So I mentioned our grebes are the smallest birds in the waterfowl group, while our geese and cranes are much, much larger. And in the middle, we've got our ducks. Also notice the bill and the tail shape. We'll point out some birds in a little bit that have a distinct tail that can help with identification. A lot of birds have very noticeable colors and patterns and in the waterfowl group, that is no exception. So if you notice some very brightly colored ducks or, or cranes, you might be looking at males. Whereas if you see a lot of brown drab looking birds, those could be some females. Perfect. So I'll point out that having a field guide is important if you're looking for any kind of, of waterfowl or birds in the outdoors. So most field guides, if it's a really extensive field guide, the waterfowl are actually in the beginning of the book. They're one of the first groups that you'll see. So if you just open it up to right at the beginning, you'll find the groups you're looking for. I like to take out a field guide if I know I'm going to be seeing birds that I maybe haven't seen before. But what I really like taking out with me is just my phone, which has the Merlin Bird ID app downloaded on it. So this is an awesome app that's free. It's through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And what you do is just download the app and then you choose your geographic location and you download specific bird packs depending on where you live and what you think you might be seeing. So for me personally, I live in Western Nebraska, so I've got a Rockies bird pack downloaded and I've got Western birds downloaded as well. In a second, we'll do a bird ID quiz. So having a field guide might be handy for this in a bit if you're unfamiliar with these birds. If you're super familiar, I would put down the field guide and try to guess it based just on the picture. And having a range map nearby is also very handy for knowing if you are seeing the bird you think you're seeing. So in this range map here, this looks really similar to how a lot of books lay it out. They'll distinguish the breeding region versus where they live year round versus where they will be during non-breeding or winter seasons. So this is, I believe, a screenshot from the Merlin app. They show peach as breeding a little bit more north for this bird, which is an American goldfinch, and then purple for year round, which is a lot of the country, and then blue for non-breeding or wintering. Okay, so time for our ID quiz. Just a couple instructions. So try to narrow down the group based on the picture. So do you think it's a dabbling duck? Do you think it's a merganser? Maybe it's a goose, maybe it's a grebe. So try to narrow it down by the group. All of the birds that we broke down just a little bit ago, I've put on the right of the screen. So like I said, waterfowl can include a lot more birds than we're talking about today, but your options will come from this side. So I made it just a little bit easier because bird waterfowl identification can be quite tricky. So try to notice if it's male or female and how you can tell. If you do know the bird right away, we appreciate that, we appreciate your bird knowledge, but please give others a chance to look it up in their bird guide if they maybe haven't seen that bird before. It's pretty fun to go through and have that feeling of adrenaline when you've gotten the bird right. And if you don't want it spoiled, maybe hide or ignore the chat while you're looking it up. Okay, for the first one, what do we think this is?
Can you all see that bird? Haven't seen any chats yet. I think we're looking through the guide. <laughs> Yep, Tyler's right. The eye on this bird is a great field mark. Also, the male has that bright white circle on the side of the face. Some black and white stripes where their wing meets their body. Okay, we've got four correct answers. It is a common golden eye. So that belongs in our diving ducks group. All right, ready for the next one. This might look very similar to a bird you see a lot of times on golf courses and parks everywhere in North America. Might help you narrow down what group it belongs to. Dark brown body and head, yep. But a white patch right in front of the eyes, white rump, orange legs, orange bill, and some kind of mottled gray, white, and tan on the front. <laughs> yep, and Linda pointed out the triangular bill, another good identifier for this group of birds. Yep. All right, we've got a ton of right answers. White fronted goose. This is actually called the greater white fronted goose. Named for that white front. And I've just seen a couple of these. Oftentimes I think I'm seeing one, but I go, oh dang, that's just a Canada goose. I get kind of disappointed. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Number three. I think we've got this one narrowed down to a group for sure. So this is a grebe of some sort. If you have a field guide handy, try to see how you can tell the difference between this grebe and its very similar looking relative. It's either a Western grebe or a Clark's. And this actually is a Western grebe. So males and females are going to look the same. Um, the Western Greaves are more numerous than Clark's, but they have really similar courtship displays. So I have this fabulous video I'm going to send you guys later of some, some Greaves seeing if they're going to mate, and it's hilarious. They look like very elegant dancers bobbing about. It's, it's pretty fabulous. So the Western Grebe and the Clark's Grebe were actually considered the same species until 1985. But because they rarely interbreed and they make different calls, they, it was chosen that they would be separated into two different species. And a way to tell the difference between Western Grebe and Clark's Grebe, if you look at this Western, it has black that goes underneath its eye and rounds out to the back of the neck, while the Clark's does not have white 
does not have black, pardon me, underneath the eye. It's white underneath the eye. So if you're able to see that close, maybe then you can get that distinction. But Western is a little bit more common. Here's our next one. This can be tricky to identify in the wild. Look for any identifying field marks you see on either of those birds. And here we have a male and female. Yep, we've got a bunch of right answers on this one as well. So this is a green winged teal. We've got a couple teals in North America. The blue winged teal looks pretty similar and the cinnamon teal is more the color of the top picture's head on most of the body. It looks a lot like a American widgeon, but like Tyler said, what field marks do you think could make it different from the American widgeon? How would we tell the difference? You would definitely be a pro if you're able to identify that female as a green winged teal just off of her alone. But we're gonna definitely point out the males and look at the color of the head. Mm -hmm. Yep, the green under the wing, you guys are all right. So, so the American widgeon and the green winged teal have a very similar, have very similar coloring on the head, but the widgeon will have more white but they both have that crescent green iridescent shape. So another field mark to point out is definitely the green under the wing. If they're in the water or if there's a lot of them around, it might be pretty difficult to see that green on the wing. So another thing to look for to know it's a teal as opposed to a widgeon is that little crescent shape right on the tip of the shoulder of the wing on the male. That'll help you distinguish, and they, you're right, they are a little bit smaller. You guys are awesome at this. <laughs> All right, last one before our bonus round. This is another one of my favorites. So the males and females have a very distinct bill shape. If you saw this one from far away on the top, you might at first think it's a mallard, but getting a closer look and seeing that yellow eye on the male and that very shovel shaped bill. So yep, here we've got our Northern shoveler. I think the males are just so gorgeous while the females have an orange bill and orange legs. So those bills, they are specially adapted to scrape through the water and scoop up anything they're trying to eat. Great work. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide and there are six pictures of different waterfowl. Try to identify just as many as you can. Some are male, some are female, but try to Try to see how you do. And I'll go through the answers at the end.
Do we have thoughts on these birds? We can get the easy ones out of the way. <laughs> Ooh, great job, Terrell. Thank you. Oh, great question, Kelsey. Kelsey asks, how do you tell the difference between horned and eared grab? I wonder if Tyler knows the answer to this one. <laughs> That's what he guessed yesterday when we went through this. He thought that was a horned grab grabe. This is an eared grebe. He also pointed out to me it's pronounced grebe, not grab, like I've been saying it for eight or nine years. <laughs> the ruddy duck is on the top right side, the one with the blue bill. I call this one the puppy dog of the duck world because it's really cute. Whereas on the other side on the top, on the left, we've got a much more elegant bird with a long tail. So that was our pintail. I think everybody pointed out the pintail. We've got the sandhill crane in the middle on the bottom. And then we've got a common merganser. So this is a female on the right bottom we're looking at a female there on the left bottom we're looking at an eared grebe and the one i did not see was the top middle i haven't seen anybody give the right answer for that one yet this is hard though <laughs> hello hi Oh, we've got it narrowed down to the right group. So it is an eider of some sort, it, but it's not a common eider. Okay. Okay. Did you Okay. Nobody's going to be checking on okay um if you hold on once okay i'll send that to you right away and did you see heather's email okay i was waiting just a couple yeah. couple more seconds to see if um okay oh there we go um, yeah we'll be in touch we've got some right answers so that okay that top so middle picture number, is right, the for king eider and that is a female so all the other birds in here, okay. um, not send sure it. about the crane I'll on the bottom, but contact. those are males. Okay. And the common merganser right. on the so on the right bottom side Bye. is also female. Fabulous work. I'm gonna go in and uh, I think I can mute everyone from oh. here. So I'm gonna do that again. There we go. <laughs> all right, let's move on. So in order to go waterfowl viewing, you obviously need to be able to find the waterfowl. During spring and fall migrations, these birds congregate in big groups on bodies of water throughout North America. So in my opinion, these migration seasons are the best time for waterfowl viewing. I happen to live in a landlocked state, so I frequent the lakes, creeks, and rivers in my area when I'm hoping to see these birds. But you might be fortunate enough to live on the coast where you can see a really great diversity of birds as well. Also, use your resources. If you use social media, especially Facebook, there are pages, groups, and meetups where you can connect with other birders and find out about bird events going on in your area. In Nebraska, my favorite 
group, my favorite Facebook group is Birds of Nebraska, which helps show me where I should go if I'm looking for a particular bird. And if you're interested in any of these resources for after this webinar, I'm definitely happy to send links and more things. Just let me know what you're looking for. Perhaps you also have a local Audubon chapter or an organization like Bird Conservancy of the Rockies that holds events for birders of all levels and ages. And this can help you find spots in your area that you can revisit throughout the year. One of my favorite things is just to pick a lake and go visit once a week or once a month for a whole season and just see what the diversity is every time I, I return. You can also do a ton of waterfowl viewing from your vehicle. So if land access is an issue where you're trying to look for birds, or if the birds keep flying away when you get close by, you can always stay in the car with a pair of binoculars or even a spotting scope and gain a lot of ground quickly doing that as well. So scopes are a really great tool for waterfowl viewing. That's what you see in the upper right picture. And last week on our Birding 101 webinar, we broke down the basics of binoculars and scopes are very similar. They have a tripod that works a lot like a tripod for a camera, and they can be set up so that they point at one area and you can keep glancing in and trying to find different birds or other people can come in and look, and you can do that all without having to move the, the scope. It's also nice because it stays in one area and it won't look wobbly when you go in and look through the viewfinder, whereas with binoculars, you have to hold a pretty steady hand if you're looking at birds that are at a great distance. Sometimes when we're waterfowl viewing, we can't get too close. So having a scope or something is, is making it, going to make it a lot easier. So these scopes do vary in price. They're kind of on the steep end of something you're buying for, for wildlife viewing. But when, after a purchase like this, it's something that you'll have for a really long time and often comes after people get their, their first field guides and their first pair of binoculars. So early mornings and evenings tend to be the best time for waterfowl viewing. If you have your ear to the ground, you might know of a duck blind you could use for great viewing. But like I said, the closer you get, the, the likely that it is they'll, they'll fly away from you if they can see and hear and even smell you. So it's best to try to kind of sneak up on them and remain hidden for best results, in my opinion. All right, so before we're done today, I just wanted to touch on some conservation for waterfowl. So waterfowl are a unique group in North America because they have a lot of folks on board to conserve their species and their habitat. So in 1986, um, the governments of Canada and the United States signed the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. So the ultimate goal for that plan is abundant waterfowl populations. Also duck stamps and licenses and hunting organizations do an amazing job at conserving these populations as well. Um, one of my favorite organizations is Ducks Unlimited. I'm not a waterfowl hunter myself, but I'm fascinated by that, that culture and that lifestyle. And they do amazing, amazing work restoring grasslands forests, watersheds, and wetlands, since that is key to conserving waterfowl. Pheasants Forever also does work across the whole country with landowners, partners, and other organizations acquiring land and helping accomplish these goals. So I touched on the duck stamps. That's that stamp you see that with the $25 on it. And this is a stamp that if you are wild, wildlife hunting, if you're, if you're doing hunting of any kind, you need some kind of license or you need a stamp that says that it's legal. A lot of the proceeds from buying these goes directly towards waterfowl conservation and habitat conservation as well. So acquiring land, restoring it, and making it fabulous for, for these animals to live. In Nebraska this last year, this is a program that's available to anyone in the nation. You can actually, if you are between the ages of five and 18, you can do a junior duck stamp contest. So this is a program where you draw a really high quality picture of a duck or paint or whatever you wanna do, and then you submit it. But each submission, even if they don't win, 
money for, for that goes to, directly towards conservation as well. So that's called the Junior Duck Stamp Contest. It's open for kids anywhere. And if you're actually an artist, you can probably do the regular duck stamp contest as well. So without these organizations and hunters whose fees go towards waterfowl conservation, wetlands in North America and waterfowl populations would definitely be dwindling even more than they already are. So remember to thank your local duck hunter next time you're going out and viewing waterfowl. All right, folks. So that's all I have for our webinar today. So if you have lingering questions, now is your time to please put those into the chat and I'll stay for a little bit to answer those questions. And if you're looking for a sp specific birding resource, we can definitely help you find that as well. So thanks for joining us today. We'll be here the same time next week for a webinar on raptors with awesome Stacy. Learn more about hawks, kestrels, and falcons. And I'll send out a link in my follow-up email that um, includes the Zoom link for the next week's webinar. Thank you so much, everybody. This is really fun. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Oh, good question about the pelicans. So pelicans are in the order Pelicaniformes. We didn't talk too much about taxonomic classification today, but just being, being part of that classification and not being a game species kind of puts them in their own group. Oh, great question about the wood duck nests as well. So they might find holes in the tree if they have a large enough hole that they can fit themselves and their mate. You might see them in the cavities. But you're right, I usually see them on the water too as opposed to nesting. Tyler, what do you think? Are wood ducks brood parasites? <laughs> Neither of us know. Great question. I'll send that out in the follow up as well.
i think one of the only ducks that are brood parasites might be the black-headed duck.